I want to read from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 27 and 28. Scoundrels create trouble. Their words are a destructive blaze. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We've been examining for several weeks now bad language, foul language, taboo language that we shouldn't use, that we shouldn't, as godly people, allow to come off of our lips. But have you ever thought which words you think are the absolute worst? What word is the worst one that you could possibly utter, that you would never utter? A lot of church people would argue that damn is the worst possible word. And that GD is the worst of the worst possible words, even though both of those words or those ideas are in Scripture, in the Bible itself. Using God's name to damn someone or something is just unacceptable. And many people in church circles just cannot stand. It, it just grates their ears to hear that. Others may say the, the F word is the absolute worst and for many years, it was banned from television and movies, even though Rhett Butler could tell Scarlett O'Hara in 1939, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And he said that in a major motion picture in 1939. But if you were to poll the nation as a whole today in 2021, you would likely find that the absolute Worst words you can use are racial slurs. GD and F-bombs are dropped all the time, even in television, but saying the N-word will get you fired, possibly even ruin your career, and it's over. A hundred years ago, right or wrong, the N-word was used freely and openly by all kinds of people of all different colors in social settings, even U.S. presidents. U.S. presidents like Woodrow Wilson, Lyndon B. Johnson, Harry Truman, even Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who so many people see as a hero, unashamedly used the N-word. It just wasn't considered that bad 60 years ago like it is today. Today, things are much different. Celebrities like Paula Dean have had their career disrupted or even ruined because of the use of those racial slurs. Even Madonna, who made a career of scandalously, unapologetically provocative behavior, had to issue an apology a few years ago. She could dance around and wear scanty clothes and say all kinds of words, but when she said the N-word, that's what got her in trouble. And she had to apologize. In the 1600s, the foulest words you could use were swear words associated with God's name. Swearing was part of society. So just like we swear in a court of law, we put our hand on the Bible and say, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In the Middle Ages, um, to use a swear in a fickle way, or in an untruthful way, was considered the most taboo, worst kind of swearing that you could do. And so although people would swear in church or swear in a court in honest ways, to swear in an unhonest way or in a fickle way in society was considered terrible. And so swear words, usually the worst things you could say would be like, by God's bones or by God's blood. Those were considered extremely taboo, not to be used in po uh, polite company. Such foul language was fit only for sailors and pirates. Incidentally, the term bloody, as used in UK, as in you bloody bastard, may have descended from the swear in the 1600s by God's blood, which eventually was shortened to bloody, which is still in England considered to be a, a very bad word that you just don't say in polite company. 
But one of the terms that we use today to pretty up our cussing is the word darn. Where does that come from? Is it simply because it sounds like the other word that we use it? I found this interesting in my research. Darn actually evolved down through the centuries from the phrase that was used in the 16th century as a swear when people would say eternal damnation. And eternal damnation got shortened to tarnation, which was used by miners and cowboys in the West. Sort of like tarnation, these mosquitoes eat me up. And then tarnation was shortened down again to tarn, T-A-R-N. People just say tarnation, that was too much. You know, when you slam your finger in a, on a, you, know, you hit your finger with a hammer, you can't go tarnation, that's too long. You just have to go tarn. And then tarn became darn. So the word that we use today that makes us sound like Ned Flanders on The Simpsons um, is actually, originally, was one of the worst curse words that you could use 400 years ago. Can you imagine Rhett Butler <laughs> saying, frankly, my dear, I just don't give a darn. It just doesn't have the same punch, does it? But we like to pretty up our words to make them more palatable. For instance, we don't eat pig, we eat pork. Why is that? It's the same animal. But pig descends from an English word, and pork descends from a French and Latin word. And so, I guess French things taste better than English things. <laughs> pork tastes better than a pig. The same rule applies for hamburgers. We don't eat cow, we eat beef. Because beef was originally a French Latin word. And so we enjoy our 100% all beef patty. We don't really enjoy 100% all cow patty. <laughs> that just doesn't do it. If you give a food a fancy French name, it's easier to swallow. Snails become escargot. Squid becomes calamari. It's the same animal. But if you call it by a French name on the menu, people will pay top dollar for it. If you call it by its animal name, you use it as fish bait. And that brings me to another form of foul language that people try to pretty up. Gossip. Gossip is one of the vilest forms of speech that comes from human lips. But ironically, it is one of the most common and accepted in polite society. If you come into the church, walk through the drawer dropping F-bombs all over the place, even the most welcoming of congregations will quickly escort you out. But gossip often runs wild in the church and nobody says a thing. This despite the extensive prohibitions against gossip throughout the Bible. Leviticus 19, 16, do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Proverbs eleven thirteen: 13, a gossip goes around telling secret, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Proverbs 17, 4, wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip, liars pay close attention to slander. Proverbs 20, 19, a gossip goes around telling secrets. Do not hang around with chatterers. And I love this one, Proverbs 26, 20. Fire goes out without wood and quarrels disappear when gossip stops. That's so true. And I could go on looking and, and quoting and referring to all of these different places in scriptures that either use the word gossip or talk about the subject of gossip and talk about it in a negative term. Just based off of the number of times the Bible speaks negatively about gossip, you would think Christians would be far more concerned about gossip than cuss words. I think Jesus would be. I know the apostles were. In Romans, the Apostle Paul listed gossip right along some of the most despicable sins you can imagine. Let me read that. Romans 1, verse 29 through 31. 
Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God's Haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful, they invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. Notice that Paul lists gossip among such despicable sins as murder and hating God. Wow. Do we think of it that way? You need to understand, destructive, sinful, disgusting language is not limited to so-called foul language. When people gossip, they are speaking in ways that scriptures say is repugnant to God. And it doesn't matter if they use polite, acceptable words. Gossip is hurtful and offensive and God hates it. The dictionary definition of gossip is casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people, typically involving details that are not confirmed as being true. That's the technical definition. But gossip is sneaky language that easily disguises itself in our conversations. If we don't clearly understand the nature of gossip, we may engage in gossip without even knowing that we're doing so. Of course, not everything that's labeled as gossip is, in fact, gossip. The fact is, and sometimes people in the church are accused of gossiping because we get together. And when we're in a community together, we talk to one another. And sometimes we talk to one another about one another. And so people who look through a lens of, of having been hurt by the church immediately sometimes will accuse Christians of being engaged in gossip. But it's not necessarily true. Sometimes it is important for us to talk about one another's business. And simply because someone's talking about your business doesn't necessarily mean that it's gossip. It just might mean that you are very ashamed of that thing that they're talking about and they need to talk about it. And because they are talking about it, all of a sudden it feels like gossip to you. But is it necessarily? Sometimes it's hard to, to tell the difference. The line that you cross that takes you into gossip is a fuzzy line sometimes. And so here are seven questions that you can ask yourself that may help you to determine if you are engaging in gossip. First of all, ask yourself, how certain am I that the information is factually correct? Because a lot of times gossip deals in things that are not true or they're only partially true. If it's not true and you're spreading it, then it's gossip. You can almost be sure of that. But here's the thing. Sometimes it doesn't, you don't intend to be spreading gossip. Sometimes you, you might wonder if something is true. And when you wonder if something's true, you begin to ask people if it's true. I mean, you might sincerely be trying to get to the bottom of the issue. And I might go to Tom and I might say something like, you know, I heard this about John, and I don't know if it's true, but I'm wondering, have you heard anything? And maybe sincerely in my heart, I'm trying to find out. But so often what happens is that what Tom hears is not, I'm not sure if this is true. He hears, here's what I heard about John. And then Tom goes and he tells someone else about it. And before you know it, by the end of the day, the whole community is talking about what John did. And John didn't do anything. We were just, we de degraded into gossip. How certain am I that the information is factually correct? You need to be very, very careful about that. And number two, ask yourself, was this info given in confidence? Was this info given in confidence? Did the person who came to me and talked with me, were they 
expecting me to keep this to myself? Because if they were, then I need to honor that. We need to not be the kind of people who are quick to tell other people about what we have heard, but keep it to ourselves. You can't have deep, meaningful relationships with people unless you are able to trust one another to keep a confidence. Because we are called as Christians to confide in one another, to bear one another's burdens, to go to one another and help one another. Sometimes someone needs to come to you and just be able to vent and get something off of their chest and be done with it. But they can't do that if they can't trust you not to go blabbing their business to other people. And so gossip destroys the ability to have real meaningful relationships in a community. It's one of the reasons why it is so disgusting and evil. Third, ask yourself, is this important enough to share? Not everything that you hear really needs to be passed on. It may feel interesting, it may be fascinating, it may be juicy, but it may not be important. It may be more important for you to keep your mouth shut than to talk about it. Number four, ask yourself, am I telling the story to build others up in Christ? Or is there some other reason that I'm sharing this? You know, so like I said, sometimes it's important to talk about a problem or to talk about a situation or an issue. You know, if someone comes to me and, um, and I feel like what they have said makes me fear that their life or someone else's life might be in danger, it might be important for me to step up and talk to someone about that. But not all things are, are that important. And maybe it's not about what's right and good for people. It's simply about what feels good to me. You know, when people gossip, you can, sometimes you can tell. If you pay really a close attention to their face. Because people who like to gossip, they'll sort of get a gleam in their eye when they get into it. I'm not one that really likes to gossip, but I really like to eat steak. And I imagine I get the same gleam in my eye when I'm about to eat a juicy ribeye. But some people get that gleam in their eye when they're about to gossip. And I want to tell you, um, they get, I, I see it on people's faces. They get excited. Oh, they got something they want to tell me. And they're so excited. It's going to be so good. But it doesn't seem that way to me. It's, it's literally disgusting. It's literally disgusting. Some people think pornography is terribly disgusting and evil. Do you realize that gossip is just as disgusting and evil? Ask yourself this question. Am I telling this story to protect others in Christ? Or is it about what I can get out of it? Am I getting entertainment out of someone else's situation at their expense? And number six, what is my motive for telling this particular person about it? You know, as I said, sometimes it is, it's important. We need to discuss situations and problems, but do I need to tell this person about it? Maybe I need to go to the person that the, the gossip is about and discuss the issue, situation with them. Going back to our earlier situation, I'm not sure if this is true, but this is what I heard, and I'm trying to get to the bottom of it and discover if this is indeed true. You know who you talked about? You know the best person to talk to, that, to, talk to about that is the person that it's about. Go straight to the source and say, I heard this, and I don't know if it's true. Can you explain it to me? And you could stop it right then and there. Get to the bottom of it and decide whether it needs to go on. But so many times instead, what we want to do is we'll go tell this person and we want to go tell that person and we'll go tell this person. And all those people don't really need to know. The last question is, have I prayed about it? If Jesus was sitting right there or standing right there in your group as you're talking about this particular bit of news, would Jesus be happy about it? 
or not. The fact is, he is there. He is there in all of those conversations. And he wants us to bear one another's burdens and lift one another up and build one another up in the faith. He wants, us to, he wants us to know that all of the people in our community, in our congregation, in our, our relationships, they've got our back. When we're not there, they're the ones that are the quickest to defend us and stand up for us, take care of us. They need to know that we've got their back, not that, that we're always at their back or talking behind their back. Gossip is poison, even though its taste is so sweet. It destroys the person who shares it, it damages the people who hear it, and it hurts people about whom we are gossiping. Gossip is deadly evil. If you are more concerned about cussing in the world outside of the church than you are about gossip in the church, then you might need to check your own spirit. You need to pray to the Lord for forgiveness for the times that you have engaged in the evil of gossip. You need to repent and make a commitment to clean up your foul language or else your foul language may make you in danger of eternal damnation. Because how we use our words matters. Our words can either build up and bring life or tear down and bring death. Let's pray that our words bring life instead of death. Gracious Father, you created the whole world. You spoke and then it was. And you created us in your image. So often we have distorted that image. That beautiful image has been turned into something ugly. Being created in your image, our words are the most important words that any animal on this planet can speak. Our communication is so much more complex than any other bird that sings or whale that squeaks. And our words can either bring life or they can bring death. Father, we pray that you will forgive us for the ways that we might have used words to bring death and hurt and damage. And help us instead to use our words to bring light and life into the darkness of this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.